Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the English kings and the Commonwealth in our continuing study of the history of civilization. We left off with King James. After he dies, his son Charles I comes to the throne, and without trying to be mean, Charles does everything wrong. He finds himself in a struggle with Parliament, and of course Parliament is that governing body that uh, meets in order to pass taxes, and there's always a struggle between the King and Parliament. But in this case, it breaks down into a uh, civil war when, when he tries to disband Parliament. He actually uh, does that by force of arms, uh, and he ends up with a civil war in his hands, Parliament against Charles, and Charles loses the war. As a result, we're going to see England going into the period known as the Commonwealth, where they're going to have no king. Charles himself uh, is executed. Um, instead of a bunch of people dying, now it's one person. The king loses his head. We also see the House of Lords abolished. And think of this in American terms. You have the House of Representatives and then you have the Senate. This would be you know, sort of the equivalent of the Senate, uh, the, the nobility. Uh, but that they're no longer going to be meeting. And instead, the House of Commons becomes the sole authority. Now, that's not a democracy, but it's moving in that direction where it's giving the common people uh, a great more authority. The the head of the Commonwealth is going to be Oliver Cromwell. He's given the title of Lord Protector. Uh, some of his adherents actually urge him to take the crown for himself, become the next king. He refuses that. He does not. He's not seeking uh, personal glory, personal ambition. Uh, he's seeking to bring about what he thinks is is correct, uh, something that will speak for and on behalf of the people. Um, now. We have the Baptists um, that are largely represented in the Commonwealth. Uh, and you think, well, OK, you've got sort of one religion now. Not entirely. You've actually got a distinction between what they would call particular versus general Baptists. The particular Baptists, uh, they are those who uh, is espouse some form of what we would call Calvinism. Uh, this is around the issue of predestination. Um, for whom did Christ die? Did he die for everyone? Or did he specifically, uh, did his death specifically bring about the salvation of those whom God has chosen? And, and even the Baptists were divided on that issue. You also have the Quakers and their inner light. Uh, they, I think they uh, have their modern counterpart perhaps a bit in the modern charismatic movement. And you've also got what were known as the ranters, uh, sort of like the Quakers, but um, they were morally permissive in their, in their approach and in their thinking. Now, it's in the middle of this that we have the rise of the Puritans who were seeking to purify the church. Many of these were Baptists, but not all of them. Uh, the term Puritan itself was used mostly by their detractors. They did not describe themselves, at least initially, with this term, although the name stuck. Um, they felt that the Church of England had not gone far enough in departing from Roman Catholicism. Remember, uh, back with Henry, who had been Roman Catholic, and then Edward, who had said, no, we're going to be Reformed, and then uh, Bloody Mary, back to Roman Catholicism. Um, Elizabeth with a middle way. Um, and so the church had gone back and forth and, and had ended up something in the middle. And the Puritans were not happy with that. They wanted to uh, remove, they wanted to purify the church and remove all of those elements of Roman Catholicism, which they saw as a false religious system. Um, they were characterized by Reformed and by Calvinistic doctrine. Uh, and now they come to the fore in this period of the Commonwealth. They had an emphasis on education and the scriptures. Remember, the Roman Catholic Church said that uh, church tradition and the Pope, they, and, and yes, the scriptures are in there too, but it's really mostly church tradition and the Pope that are our final authority. With the Puritans and with the Reformed, they were saying, no, the scriptures are our final authority. And so if the scriptures are our final authority, then we need to be able to read them. We need to be able to read and write. And the Puritans are going to advance the cause of education. Among the Puritans, literacy is going to go far higher than it ever had been anywhere in the world prior to their coming. 
It's during this time that uh, we have the Westminster Assembly, a gathering of 121 Puritan clergy who meet in order to put forth a doctrinal statement that will be the doctrinal statement for the churches of both England and Scotland. Um, many of these Puritans have, uh, have been influenced by, uh, in fact, I think all of them had been influenced by theology coming down from Scotland. Remember that Knox had been influenced himself by Calvin. And so there's a strong Calvinistic uh, leaning toward this, this doctrinal statement. That doctrinal statement is still held by a number of denominations, Reformed denominations, I should say, uh, even to this day. Now, I also need to speak about church government, because the Church of England, beginning with, with Henry VIII, who had said we're going to split off from, from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church in its church government was, was Episcopal. By that, I mean that uh, Episcopal sees has one leader of the church uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, that would be the Pope, and then you it, it, all authority sort of goes downhill from there uh, to the cardinals, to the bishops, to the priests, to the deacons, to the all the way down to the people. Um, when the Church of England had been formed, it also had that same Episcopal form of government with the king, well, you can't really have the king as head of the church, even though they called it that, uh, but at least the archbishop. But again, the, the form of government was the same. You had the archbishop, the head bishop, and then other bishops under him, and then, then other clergy under that, but it's from the top down. Now, the polar opposite of that is congregationalism, where the congregation decides everything. You know, we're going we're gonna to change the color of the carpet, and everybody comes and votes. We're going to change pastors, and everybody comes and votes. That's congregationalism. Notice you don't have that in Episcopal. Uh, in the Episcopal Church, it, it's decided from the top down. You don't vote for your leaders. Uh, it's, it's decided from up on high. A compromise between those two uh, is what is called Presbyterian. The word Presbyterian just means from the Greek word uh, presbyteros, which means old guy or, or elder. And they uh, went to the New Testament and the Presbyterians are saying, wait a second, uh, I don't really read about a pope in the New Testament. I don't read about the congregation deciding everything. Instead, they had elders, uh, first apostles, but then later on, in, even in the book of Acts, you have elders that are mentioned. And they are deciding uh, and yet they are perhaps chosen by the congregation at large. And so it's sort of a combination. You, you take both of these two extremes and you bring them together for this Presbyterian form of government. Now, Scotland had become Presbyterian. And that form of church government now comes down to England during the Westminster Assembly, and the Westminster Confession is Presbyterian in its form of church government. But, but that's not going to last in England. So that in 1660, we see the restoration. This is um, after Oliver Cromwell dies. Uh, remember, he did not take the title of king. Uh, and so when he dies, uh, they look about for what are we going to do for rulership now? And it's decided to bring back the son of Charles I that they had, they had condemned to death. Uh, Charles II, his son, he's got two sons, but, but Charles II is the oldest, and he's proclaimed king of England. Uh, the problem is he's Roman Catholic. And under him, the, Roman, uh, the Commonwealth is considered null and void, and Presbyterianism is going to continue in Scotland, but no longer in England. Uh, so they will return to the Church of England and uh, some of those elements that they had gotten used to. Uh, in 1662, they passed the Act of Uniformity, which mandates in the church bishops and priests and deacons. You see, it's not just the elders and deacons that are, that are seen in the Westminster Confession, but now they're going to notice go back in the direction of Roman Catholicism with bishops and priests and deacons. Um, and at this point, 2,000 of the clergy who are of a Puritan persuasion, they all just get up and resign. We, cannot, we can no longer be a part of that church because that church, in their opinion, is apostatizing and going back to its Roman Catholic roots. However, all dissenting religious groups are forbidden to meet, and this includes these 2,000 Puritan clergy. They are not allowed to meet. They're not allowed to have private congregations. Uh, they are forbidden to meet. Now, Charles II, as we said, uh, becomes the king, and he is supported by Catholic France, um, but he has no heir. And so when he dies in 1685, 
the crown now goes to his brother, James II. Remember, James I had been King James, uh, the one who brought about the King James Version. James II now becomes king. And even though he's Roman Catholic, he has two Protestant daughters. And the people look at him and they say, well, okay, we can put up with him because after all, when he dies, then the crown can go to one of his two Protestant daughters and everything will be okay. And we'll, we'll sort of, you know, we can wait him out. However, his wife then gives birth to a son and that changes everything. And so uh, a movement comes against him and he is deposed in what's called the Glorious Revolution. Uh, remember the French Revolution, when we get there, we're going to see all sorts of people put, uh, getting put to death. The Glorious Revolution, nobody's put to death or virtually no one. And, and James and his uh, wife and their, their infant son are going to be exiled but nobody dies over this revolution, which perhaps does make it glorious. In their place, we now have uh, William and Mary. Uh, William is a Dutch Protestant. He's Calvinist, uh, and he's married to his cousin uh, Mary, the daughter of James II, uh, and one of those Protestant daughters. Uh, and so that's going to bring about, it's going to bring England back in the direction of, of uh, Protestantism, or at least that middle way and they sign the English Bill of Rights. That English Bill of Rights now that allows Puritans to, uh, permits them to preach and to establish their own churches. Uh, and that's going to be huge, which means that England now will become legally uh, pluralist in its religion, at least as regards to its Christianity. Uh, and so Puritans can now preach and establish their own churches. Meanwhile, on the continent, and this is, you know, England is going through its issues, but on the continent, we have the Thirty Years' War, which really starts as just a struggle between the Bohemian, uh, uh, Bohemians against their Roman Catholic monarch. Uh, Bohemia, remember, that's what we call the Czech Republic today, uh, Eastern Europe. And eventually people begin to take sides so that we have, and it's largely religious in nature, um, although not completely, because we have the uh, Roman Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Emperor and Spain and the Habsburgs, um, uh, Bavaria and Poland, they're all on the Roman Catholic side. Uh, over against what starts off as the Protestants uh, against them, the German nobles and Netherlands and Denmark and Sweden. But France, which is Catholic, actually takes sides against Spain. So this, this war is in, in a, it's got a religious face to it, but it's not entirely religious because we have both France and even the Ottomans. Remember, they're in Turkey and they, they're, um, they are Muslim. Uh, they're on the other side. Uh, and so even though it starts one way, um, it expands to cover all of continental Europe. And so during this war, this is a, a period of what we could call total war, where it's not just one army against the other army, it's armies against uh, the peoples and the countryside and the nations. And Germany in particular is physically devastated as a result of this war. It marks the end of the Holy Roman Empire which, as Voltaire said, was uh, neither holy nor Roman nor an empire any longer. Uh, and there's some truth to that. Uh, but we're not going to see that holy Roman empire uh, in anything but name after this. Um, as a result of the Thirty Years' War, Calvinism will be added to the Peace of Augsburg. The Peace of Augsburg had said that you could, you know, Lutherans were permitted and Roman Catholics were permitted, but that was it. And now the, a Calvinism also is added to that as a third option. And this also marks the, the independence of both the Netherlands and also Switzerland. Uh, the Swiss will, will gain their independence um, at, at, the, at the close of the Thirty Years' War. The, this is concluded at what is called the Peace of Westphalia. An international framework uh, is established for, for nations to come together and to work together and to provide peace. Uh, the principal, principalities of the Holy Roman Empire, or what had been the Holy, Holy Roman Empire, are made more independent, which is why I said there's not going to be a continuation of that empire anymore. And it reaffirms that Peace of Augsburg, uh, permitting uh, Lutheranism, but also adding Calvinism. 
uh, as we enter into this period of peace. Now, the Pope Innocent the Tenth he condemns the Treaty of Westphalia, the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, everybody ignores him, <laughs> and, and uh, he never did agree to it. But everybody else goes along with it, and now peace comes, uh, at least for a brief time, uh, to to Europe. And so with the 30 years, uh, with the end of the 30 years war, remember we have Anglicanism in England. Uh, they're largely not part of that. Uh, we have the Roman Catholic countries, uh, Portugal and Spain and France, even though they've been on the other side, they're still Roman Catholic and Italy. Uh, I'm not going to mark off uh, Switzerland um, because uh, there's quite a bit of uh, reformation in the Swiss Alps, but that's they're a little island in that. And I should say uh, southern Germany, the Bavarian region, that's all going to be Roman Catholic. Um, to the north, I have the Protestant countries, northern Germany, also uh, Holland. Uh, and the Scandinavian countries to the north. To the east, we have the Russian Orthodox. Uh, and remember, that's not the same as Roman Catholic. Uh, these are, this had been uh, had its affinity with the Eastern Orthodox from Istanbul, uh, or back in those days, it had been called Constantinople, which brings us to the fourth section, and that's Islam, which had uh, taken uh, Constantinople, but now is going to move strongly into Central Europe um, and that's going to be the next thing that Europe faces. The Battle of Vienna in 1683 is a case of the Ottoman Turks, and remember those are Muslims, that come and besiege the city of Vienna. A European coalition comes together to stop this because they see if Vienna falls, then next all of Europe will fall to Islam as Africa had fallen, as uh, Constantinople had fallen, as the entire Christian empire had fallen at a much earlier age. And so we have the Habsburgs and the Holy Roman Empire, or at least what's left of it, uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And this actually marks the turning point in Muslim expansion up to this point. The Muslims had taken uh, Greece and the Baltic, the Baltic, uh, uh, or the, the, the countries, I'm sorry, uh, leading up to the, uh, uh, all the way up to Vienna. Um, but now they're going to be halted at the Battle of Vienna. And Tradition has it that with their defeat, the bakers in Vienna uh, celebrated by forming their little cakes uh, in the shape of a crescent. Now, the way you say crescent in that language is croissant. Uh, and to this day, um, you can go into a perhaps a restaurant and order a croissant, uh, but you're actually eating something that's marking the, the celebration of the defeat of the Turks at the Battle of Vienna, which marks the fact that Europe is going to remain largely Christian, at least in name, uh, all the way up, all the way up to the present.